Well, good evening. Welcome to our Ash Wednesday service here at St. John's. Uh, we're entering into the season of Lent, and certainly if there's an image that's seared in our mind throughout the Lenten season, it's the suffering and pain that Jesus experiences on our behalf as he goes to the cross for us. So our theme throughout Lent is, is a reflection of that. We're talking about pain and how we get through what we're going through. Pain is inevitable. None of us signs up for it, but we all face it every day. You come here tonight with some level of pain in your lives, and how does Jesus help us to get through what we're going through? So it's a full service tonight. There's imposition of ashes earlier on in the service. There's an opportunity to receive communion later in the service. So settle yourselves in. Uh, enjoy the opportunity to journey with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to the cross for us. So you can stand, uh, turn and welcome each other to worship tonight, and then we'll join in singing our opening hymn, Jesus Sinners Doth Receive.
so we gather as sinners knowing that Jesus receives us in his name, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we enter into the season of Lent, it's intentionally a penitential season, and so we join together in a time of confession tonight using the words of Psalm 51. I'll invite you to speak the bold portions in response. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. You who are God, my Savior, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, you, God, will not despise. And so with penitential hearts, understanding that because of our sin, we all have to face our own mortality, you're invited to come tonight and receive the imposition of ashes. Uh, you can choose whether you would like to participate in that or not. If you do choose to participate, the ushers will be inviting you to come forward from the sides. And you can choose whether you want to have that placed on your forehead or if you'd like that simply placed on your hand, extend your hand to us and we'll mark you with ashes, remembering that dust we are and to dust we shall return. You may be seated.
We spoke the words of Psalm 51 as we confessed our sin, as we faced our own mortality. A little bit of the backstory of Psalm 51 is that David spoke these words of confession after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba, after she had gotten pregnant. And as that child came into this world, as a consequence of that sin, God said that child will not live. And in that moment, David had to face not only his own mortality, but the mortality of his child. And yet in that, he spoke with confidence, knowing that he would see that child again in eternity. And tonight we can face our own mortality, and we can come forward and we can be marked with ashes, but we're also marked with the sign of the cross, knowing that yes, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So celebrate that tonight, and as you go through this season, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Our scripture reading is taken from Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. This is the word of the Lord. We join in singing, In the Shattered Bliss of Eden.
Let's pray. Lord God, each of us comes tonight with pain and hurt and heartbreak and sin that has clung to us. Lord, help us to continue to come to grips with that reality and to see your suffering and death, which brings us through the pain to victory in you. In your name we pray. Amen. So as many of you are walking into church tonight, I was outside of our sanctuary greeting you. And uh, often as I'm greeting people, not only as they're walking into worship, but as I'm interacting with them in the community, uh, one of the common questions that I think we all ask is, how are you doing? Or how's it going? And a question like that only gets you so far. There's only a surface level answer that most of us give. And so if you really want people to be honest, you have to change the question. So what if as you walked in tonight, I changed the question and I said, not how are you doing, but how are you suffering today? Because here's the truth. All of us carry pain. All of us are suffering on some level. Each of you showed up tonight and there's some level of hurt that you have. This is part of the human experience. There's internal pain and there's external pain. There's, there's spiritual pain and there's relational pain. There's physical pain and there's emotional pain. And some of it's low-level annoyance that we carry with us and just wish it wasn't this way. And then some of it's, it's deeply dis- debilitating to us. And I know some of you walk in here tonight and you're trying to hold it together, but you're carrying a significant level of pain with you. And I want you to carry that with you through the season of Lent because that's what we want to talk about this Lenten season. We want to talk about your pain. And tonight as we start that conversation, I want to seek to diagnose that pain that each of us carries. And in that, I want to acknowledge there's a difference between the symptoms and the source of suffering. The pain that you and I carry through life is often just symptomatic. The heart that hurts, the head that aches, the stomach that churns, the guilt that we carry with us, often these are just symptoms of something that that is deeply rooted in us, of something that we're invited to realize and to seek to resolve. And so one of the critical questions that we have to ask as we're confronted with our own pain is this. Where is this coming from? Where is this pain coming from? And this is what happens if your tooth aches and you have to go in to see the dentist. He's going to poke around, he's going to take some x-rays, and he's going to attempt to answer that question. Okay, where is this pain that you're feeling? Where is it coming from? This is what we do as parents with our kids when they come home in that sullen mood, and we realize, hey, there's some level of suffering, there's some level of pain in their life right now. I don't know what it is, and so I have to lean in and I have to ask questions in order to try to diagnose where is that pain coming from. This is what happens if you go to see a counselor and and maybe it's over some relationship struggle that you're experiencing or maybe just emotionally something's not quite right in your life and so you want somebody to talk this out with and what does the counselor do? They ask you a series of questions to try to get to the root of where that pain is coming from. It's what happens if you hit your head and you have to go to the ER Okay, where is the source of this pain? Where is this coming from? It's what happens if you walk into my office and you say, Pastor, I've got a problem. I need somebody to talk through with this. I'm going to sit there and I'm going to listen, but I'm going to dig a little bit more to try to understand what is the source of that pain and suffering in your life. And before the symptoms can subside, we have to go to the source. Because if we merely treat the symptoms, and so often that's what we do, the pain still remains. 
And so tonight what I want to do with you is I want to take a look at what the Bible has to say. Because you can look through the pages of Scripture and you can see that it is plastered with people who have pain in their lives. You look at people who are suffering on varying levels. They are suffering because they are in conflict with each other. They are suffering because they are alienated from God. They are suffering because of disease or sickness or warfare or natural disasters that happen. And you ask yourself, where is all this pain for them and for us coming from? What's the source of it? If you look at Scripture, you go all the way back to the first reference to pain. It's in Genesis chapter 3, and I want you to listen to these words. To the woman, God said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. To Adam, he said, cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. So this is in the context of the fall into sin. And, and what is the curse? It's all about pain that you and I experience. Because God didn't create us to experience a world filled with pain. He created a world with a pain-free existence, a world that was intended to bring us great joy and great fulfillment. And yet as soon as sin enters the picture, now that picture is shattered. And we see and experience suffering. And you can look at Genesis chapter 3, and not only here in these, these references that he gives to, to the pain in childbirth, even to the pain in child rearing, to the pain that, that happens for us in the unfulfillment and the frustration that we find in our own work. But there are, on multiple levels, you can see different categories in which sin causes suffering. You, you can see it when it comes to spiritual alienation. As soon as Adam and Eve sin, what do they do? It says that they hide from God. And when he calls them out, like, why are you hiding? They say, because we were afraid. So there's spiritual alienation. And, and, and there's, there's frustration when it comes to their social interactions with each other. Because now they start playing the blame game with each other. And they're at odds with each other. They're fighting to assert which one of them is right, which one of them should dominate. And you can see that there's pain and suffering. You can see it in the inner psychological pain that they carry with them because as soon as they sin, it says that, that they're filled with, with shame. And you can see that there's now impending doom that they're facing. As a result of their sin, they're now facing death. And on their way toward that, there's disease and there's natural disasters. And now uh, all of creation groans. And all of creation, as Romans chapter 8, has been subjected to decay. Things are not the way that they're supposed to be. And all of that's right here in Genesis chapter 3. And you can ask yourself, where does this pain originate? Where is this pain coming from? And on the basis of Genesis chapter 3, you can attribute it to one of three different causes. You can say that it's the devil, you can say that it's the world, and you can say that it's our own sinful flesh. Sometimes we refer to that as the unholy trinity. Everything that God desires for us, these three seek to thwart. If you're using alliterative terms, the unholy trinity is Satan, society, and our sinful nature. And so you've got the temptations of Satan as he strategizes, as he attempts to twist God's word. Did God really say that? Did God tell you that that, that was hands off? No, it's not. Go ahead, try it. You'll like what you experience. And to this day, Satan continues those same tactics. And then you've got, you've got society as it was originally defined. It was simply Adam and Eve. And we're influenced by each other. And there are times where society leads us astray. And so Eve offers something to Adam. And what does Adam do? He succumbs to the peer pressure just like you and I do. Because if someone else says that it's worth trying, then we need to try it for ourselves. 
And then on top of that, there's, it, there's their, their own sinful tendencies where, where they desire something that they don't have, and, and we tend to do the same. I don't have this. I want this. And we think that it's going to offer to us pleasure, but it doesn't. In the end, it leads to pain and frustration. And as you look at your life right now and some of the pain that you're experiencing, I would invite you to consider where is that coming from? What's the source of it? Is it coming from Satan's attacks? Is it coming from society's influence on you? Or is it coming from your own sinful nature? Or maybe it's coming from a combination of all of the above. But what we do, especially as we go through the season of Lent, and what I want to do with you tonight is I want to key in on that last one. I want to talk about sin. Because I believe that suffering and pain are either a direct or an indirect result of sin. And sometimes it's our own sin. Sometimes it's choices that we've made. And God says because of the choices that you've made, there are going to be natural consequences for that. Or there's going to be some form of punishment that we receive for that. So sometimes it's our own actual sin. But sometimes it's because of original sin that we experience pain. It's because Adam and Eve originally sinned. And because of that, we've now seen the effects of sin throughout society and in the hearts of people and even in the created order. And that's where we see disease and natural disaster come into play. Is that a result of any one particular sin that somebody has committed? Is that God's way of doling out punishment on people? Uh, not necessarily. But on one level or another, that is the result of sin. Uh, one question I would encourage you to ask yourself as you carry around pain in your life is simply this. How has my sin contributed to the pain that I feel right now? Because this is what the season of Lent invites us into. It invites us into a time of reflection and genuine repentance where we peel back the layers of the onion, so to speak, and we can ask ourselves, is this pain that I carry somehow related to an unconfessed sin that I've committed? So I think back to a couple of months ago, and I could just tell that something was off in how I was feeling, and, and I didn't know how to describe it or how to define it. Maybe it was some level of discouragement, maybe it was some level of disillusionment, maybe it was even on some level, maybe a, a little bit of depression. But whatever it was, I wasn't comfortable with it, and I didn't want to live with it. And I needed to diagnose it. And the way for me to do that was to call up one of my good friends and mentors who is a seasoned pastor and to say, we need to sit down and talk because I'm struggling. And so we sat down over lunch and I explained to him how I was feeling. And he asked questions, which helped me to peel back the layers and get to the root of it which, shocker of shockers, was a sin in my life. And embedded in that was, was misplaced expectations, was unrealistic expectations that I was placing on other people. I expected others to always get it right. And the more that I saw people not getting it right, the more frustrated and confused and disillusioned and discouraged and yes, even depressed, I became. And then I said it. I said, I've been looking to others to be the Messiah. And they're not. And they can't be. Because only Jesus can. I can't even be the Messiah. And in that moment, I felt this fizzle of false messiahs. And I was able to confess that. And my friend and mentor was able to share with me words of forgiveness. And I walked away from that conversation, and I gotta tell you, the pain was gone. I was not carrying that load with me anymore. 
Now, does that mean that it doesn't occasionally pop up in my life, that I don't still feel those things on some level? Yeah, it happens. But then what do I do? I go back to that reality. Confessing that sin and receiving God's forgiveness in my life. And that's what Lent is. It's a time for us to lean in, to wrestle with our own sin, to reflect upon it, and to genuinely repent of it. So, uh, the series that we're doing is called Getting Through What You're Going Through. All of us have pain. And the place where we start is by simply taking a pain inventory, identifying what is that pain in our life. And then we take that step to look back and to say, where is that coming from? Where is that pain in my life coming from? And we seek to diagnose it. But that's not the final step. There's another step that we need to take because it's not only about where I am now, it's about how do I get through what I'm going through. In other words, where is this going? What's the prognosis? So if you look at Genesis chapter 3, we know that there's suffering because of sin. But what's the prognosis? What's the prognosis for Adam and Eve and what's the prognosis for you and I? i got to tell you, initially you look at Genesis chapter 3 and it's not good. Because here's what it says. Genesis chapter 3 verse 19. You will experience pain, God says, until you return to the ground. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. The prognosis for you and I is death. That's where your story is moving. That's where my story is moving. We're confronted tonight, this Ash Wednesday, with our own mortality because of our sin. There's a poet named John Donne, and he's probably most famous for uh, one of the lines that he says in one of his writings, and he simply talks about, for whom the bell tolls. But to flesh that out a little bit more, He says, ask not for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. And here's the backstory behind that. John Donne is writing this during a time when the bubonic plague is sweeping across Europe. And people are dying in the masses. He's just lost his own wife, who's left behind seven young children. And now he's suffering with the bubonic plague. He's lying in bed facing his own mortality, as he hears the bell of a church begin to toll. And he wonders, hmm, who's that bell tolling for? Is it tolling for a friend? Is it tolling for a neighbor? Because the tradition was that when there was a funeral, and maybe some of you grew up in churches where when there was a funeral, you would toll the bell in honor of that person church I grew up in, you would toll it at the end of the funeral one time for every year of life for that individual. And so he's laying there in bed and he hears the bell tolling and he writes, ask not for whom the bell tolls because it tolls for thee. He knew in that moment that not yet, but one day that bell would be tolling for him just like it is for you, just like it is for me. That's the prognosis in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve, along with the rest of humanity, our suffering ends in death. Thankfully, that's not the only prognosis in Genesis chapter 3. Because there's actually a little hint of hope It's called the the Proto-Euangelion, or the first gospel in Scripture. And it's the words that the Lord speaks to the serpent in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. And then here's the gospel. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. From that point forward, Satan would be striking at the heels of humanity. 
attempting to inflict pain. And he was pretty effective at that. Even to the point that God sent his own son Jesus into this world to share in our pain and our suffering. And what did Satan do? He inflicted pain upon him to the point that he suffered and died on the cross. And yet I want you to notice the way that Genesis 3 verse 15 puts that. It says, he will crush your head. In other words, this offspring from Adam and Eve, this Christ, this Messiah, will crush the head of Satan Well, Satan can only strike his heel. Striking the heel is just a glancing blow. But crushing the head, that's a fatal blow. And so the blow that Christ receives as he suffers and dies on the cross, that's not fatal. That's not final. It's a glancing blow until Jesus in his resurrection crushes the head of Satan. You see, this is who Jesus is. Jesus is the serpent crusher. Don't you love that language? Like, it makes me think of, that would make a really good name for a monster truck. Like, you're going to Monster Jam and they're introducing the trucks and here is the serpent crusher. I mean, I'm going to cheer for the serpent crusher all the time. That's who our God is. He's the serpent crusher. He's the one who sent his son to stomp on the head of Satan and to say, yeah, he might inflict pain upon you now, but not forever. And so Paul can say in Romans chapter 16, verse 20, it says, the God of peace, and that word peace is the, is the word shalom. It means that there's a pain-free existence that God desires for us. The God who brings peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. So I don't know where you're experiencing pain in your life right now, but all of us walk in here with some level of pain. Some it's low-level annoyance. Some it's rather debilitating. But as we journey through this season of Lent, let me invite you to take a pain inventory, to understand what pain you're experiencing And then to do some digging and to ask yourself, where is this coming from? What's the source of this suffering? And wherever that's an unconfessed sin in your life, use this season to bring it up, to confess it, to confess it here at church, to confess it in the presence of a trusted confidant. And then in that to know that the prognosis to your pain does not end in death. That there is a death defeater who walks with you through this life. May that be enough to get you through whatever you're going through. Amen. Let's stand as we pray. Lord Jesus, all of us are here carrying some level of pain be it emotional or relational or spiritual or physical. Lord, remind us that the prognosis for our pain is not death. That because of your son Jesus, the serpent crusher, the death defeater, that we can get through whatever we're going through. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, each of us carries in our own hearts people who are in pain. People in our own families. People in our church. People in our community. People around the world. People who are suffering physically. People who are in relationships that are being ripped apart. People who are in war-torn regions of the world. Lord, we lift them to you. And we ask that you would remind them of those words of Scripture, the God of peace, the God who brings peace, wants peace for us, will soon crush Satan under our feet. Lord, in your mercy, Lord, tonight as we come to receive communion, we thank you that you are a God who takes our pain. 
who shares it, who suffers on our behalf, and who gives us of your body and your blood so that we can get through whatever we're going through, confident that you are with us and that your forgiveness is sure. Lord, in your mercy, these prayers and others, Lord, we lift to you in the name of your Son, Jesus, as he's taught and invites us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with favor and give you now and always his peace. Amen. As Lent is a season of 40 days, we close by singing, O Lord, throughout these 40 days. Thank you.